I uh, know, he's, he's, he's very kind. Uh, by the way, this is a little bit out of date because I, uh, I, I'm not, not anymore with uh, Holden Barrett. I, I'm now going to focus on Gen AI, which is really cool. Uh, and by the way, if you think Gen AI is going to be massive, you have no idea. I think is the, the biggest thing I've seen for a long time. So I'm going to speak very fast. I'm going to accelerate a lot. But and, and actually, li like you said, most of the comments I have is, it was super fast, but I under understood everything. So for me, it means that it kind of works reasonably well. So it's 2024. Like, uh, you know, actually, I just reused those photos, right? Uh, so that's from 7 October. I actually found, I think, one of the first ones from 25th of July, 2020. Actually, no, from 2011, right? Uh, 2004, sorry, that I sent. And so, and I, I even had an interesting, you know, looking back on this. And one of the things that I would say, especially for maybe for the, the younger generation here, it's okay to be ignored, right? You play the long game, right? It's okay, right? As long as you have your own ideas and you, you put things out and you open source stuff. Like, I was that crazy to, you know, to beat up Microsoft publicly, right, on ASP.net, right, as you guys can see here, right? And this is me publishing. And at the time, they didn't have a good sense of humor, right? So <laughs> I think now probably they'll be a bit different, right? Although the thing that's interesting about this is like you publish these things and you think sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. I actually think I was right in a lot of things, right? And I think there's a lot of cool stuff in here. I was wrong about, um, the share hosting, because I thought, I thought there would be more expectations happening, right? And, uh, and, he, and he hasn't. So, which is an interesting thing, right? Because I still feel that in AppSec, we, we got away with a lot. In the past, I don't think we will in the medium term. But I think in the past, you know, we got away, a lot of business got away with not having a lot of security apps. But, and we from the generation that we were like, this is a big thing. And it went from everybody ignoring to people like going, oh, actually, maybe it is something important, right? So here's the thing, right? So AppSec is not about application security. Right, let's just be clear, right? AppSec is about good engineering, architecture, risk management, project management, asset, oh, that's asset, sorry. Asset. By the way, I was finishing up the slides just before. Asset data, uh, CIA, uh, uh, information observability, resilience, and instance response, right? Like, you get all of these right, you don't need AppSec. Right? It, is, it is that simple, right? I once had this really cool conversation with an, in, an insane engineer, and he looked me in the eyes, and he was one of, you know, one of the big cloud providers. He says, we don't have an AppSec team. I was like, what? You know, I was like, come on, how can you do it? And he said, tell me anything you do in AppSec. And I was like, well, all right, you know, data validation. He goes, of course we do data validation. You think, you think what, what thing are we doing here? Authentication, authorization, logging, everything you can think of AppSec, right? Or application security. They were doing it, right? Because it was a good engineering practice. Because they, they, you know, they had that level of maturity. Now, there's not that many teams in the world that can do that, right? I think the problem here is scale. But I've always, for a while, had this idea that, you know, when we tell the developers, right, are doing it wrong, which is something that we tell a lot, right? We miss a big trick, which is the developers are the ones who are least responsible for writing insecure code, right? The, when you say developers should know better, developers don't know what they're doing, they don't care, you are immediately saying you don't understand what you're talking about. Right? Because the developers, and, and, you know, and you should develop, look, I code, right? This is actually, you know, me, I, I think I am because I code, right? Um, you know, developers have the least amount of impact, right? Themselves, the personal, the individual, right? On writing secure code, writing secure, you know, secure applications. Is the ecosystem around that. You can get the best, most experienced developer in the planet. You put them in an environment where they have crazy deadlines. They don't have good CI pipelines. They don't understand the side effects they're doing. They work with frameworks they never worked before. They're going to write in secure code. It is that simple, right? So what we need to do is we need to create an ecosystem that creates an environment where we actually have actually safe code, which I want to talk in a second, right? So here's the interesting thing about this, right? So for me, this is what it's all about, right? So basically, I think in the past, well, a lot of industries got away with it, right? They got away with it because you can solve something here and you had a career. You had a career, you had a product, you actually, you know, there's insane people who made a lot of money, a lot of great careers were built by solving a fringe of each of these, including AppSec, right? Including, including some of our careers, right? Exist around that, right? At the time, your competitors, uh, the competing products from here were all marginally better, right? So they were 10%, 20% better, you know, a little bit better, right? With Gen AI, that's gonna change. So here's the interesting thing, right? When these Gen AI industries, right? When these industries go into Gen AI, right? when they also, because remember, we're not the only industry, right? That is looking at Gen AI, right? When they go into Gen AI, basically, they will be able to do AppSec, right? Better than AppSec, right? 
It is, it's, it's a bit like you go to Copilotin or go to ChatGPT and go, hey, can you rewrite this code for me, right? And he's actually doing a better job than some of the application security professionals in the planet today, right? So, and if you think about it, right, if you talk about, oh, I'm going to do source code analysis, right? Guess what? A great QA tool will be able to do that, right? You want to understand what you, you, you know, your, which one of the bills to fix, a, a really good Gen AI risk management tool will do that. You want to figure out how to fix things, the next gen project management is going to do that. Right? Most of the things that we do, the next gen of this are going to do it, not because they want to you know, aim at AppSec, it's just because it's going to be one of the things they're going to do. Right? And I think that there's a lot of companies, a lot of industries, they have no idea what's coming for them. Right? Uh, because, in a way, when they generate the industry, they just are amazing at what they do. They, it's a bit like when everybody was working on these, all these models, all this stuff, and then ChatGPT came along and became better than them in one go. Not better than it, even a little bit, just better orders of magnitude, right? That's what's going to happen, right, in a lot of these industries. But here's the cool thing, right? So, you know, in our world, right, and the AppSec world, is that I think we can do the same to those industries, right? I think that in a couple of years, right, or months, right, a lot of these Gen AI AppSec will be better than some of these, right? Because we, you know, the question here is who's going to get there first, right? Because we, although, for example, like, think about it, like, if you take a good um, AppSec static analysis, you know, code analysis tool that suddenly goes, oh, I'm going to create some tests. I'm going to create some unit tests, some integration tests. I'm going to actually feed some data from my, um, let's say, my, my, my feeds, my logs. I'm going to static analyze, dynamic analysis. I'm going to combine the whole thing, which I'll talk in a bit, right? You know what? We haven't just done an AppSec tool. We created probably the best QA tool that exists out there. Right? And guess what? The business doesn't have a QA tool at that level. Right? So the interesting thing is that whoever comes up with a really amazing Q, you know, AppSec tool for code testing it cr will create at the same time one of the best QA tools that exists in the planet. Right? The moment that we figure out how to fix vulnerabilities, right? and, and by the way, you know, whenever you guys say, I have vulnerabilities, it's easy to fix, you know, that's bollocks. Right? Finding who to fix is half the problem. Right? Finding who can fix it, who's going to pay for it, how you're going to schedule, getting on the backlog, who's going to project manage, how you're going to reward that. All of that needs to happen right? before you even fix anything. Take into account that you haven't even figured out what's the blast radius of that fix. Right? So when we, who else solves that? Is that's how, again, we felt security will be hitting a lot of other industries, right? which is really cool. So here's the question. Right? We either going to become a commodity or going to be the one commoditized. Right? And the reason why I believe this is going to happen is because Gen AI is a game changer, right? And I, I generally believe it's, it's, I was thinking about the analogy, it's about, it's a little bit like in another parallel universe, right? The internet haven't really occurred, right? You know, you know, let's say AOL had one, right? Or Nokia had one, and it was all walled gardens, right? It was all this nice little, not very evolved. And then in one go, you had broadband, right? You had clouds. And, um, and then that just arrived, right? Um, and we have cloud compute. Yeah, you have the internet, the cloud compute, and broadband, right? In one go, right? Imagine that world. And then people went along, you know, going along, ah, oh, it's kind of OK, but there's a lot of pictures of cats, right, on that thing, right? It's the same thing. Like, the way I look at it is that Gen AI is not about creating content. In fact, it's, we, you know, I think we need to look around it. The fact that it can create content is a side effect of how good it is, right? But, but Gen AI is not about creating content. It just it happens to be crazy good at it because everything else it does. With Gen AI, especially with ChatGPT, you can reason with it. You can have logic. You can apply conversations. I have debates now with ChatGPT that are some of the most insane conversations I ever had from a technical point of view. Right? I am 10x more productive. I'm not being funny. Right? The way I code now, in fact, I wrote an exploit recently. I was like, wow, this is freaking awesome, right? Like, because you're just that productive, right? And it's, it's incredible. So, you know, like, actually, I had the same slide of it, right? See, there was a world where, you know, somebody won here, right? But, you know, for the ones that be older, right, there was a time it could have been Nokia, right? It could have been the mobile. It could be the apps. It could be the social networks. Any of them could have, you know, won that world, right? It just happened to be, in a way, was, you know, actually, I felt, right, that really brought that together, right? So. And I actually asked ChatGPT about this, you know, again, like, this is really cool, right? So look, I went to ChatGPT, and all I did was I copy and paste that and say, hey, any other companies to add? 
Like, think about the logic of that, right? These days, my cover series chat GPT is screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. On picture one, I'll have this. On picture two, I'm trying to do that. On picture three, I have this problem. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? It's incredibly productive, right? It's really cool. And it's just a start, right? And then again, you know, I, then I can go, OK, this is the coming before. What about this? So you can see the kind of dialogue. And this is just a very, very small example. Like on my LinkedIn, I have really other cool examples, right? So. This means that we have an opportunity over the next months to really fulfill the AppSec destiny, which I think some of us have been trying to do for 20 years, right? And here's an idea of what it is, right? I think our destiny, and us, right, is to create a safe and trusted applications that are able to protect our assets, right? And assets is important from malicious agents, actors, and events. And even events is interesting because sometimes most companies, the biggest attacker is actually the company itself. Right? If you actually look at the biggest damage to the company, was created nothing, it was not an attacker, right? It's literally a bug, it's a problem, etc. Right? But if they look at it, it still affect everything else. So I think, you know, I think that's where we want to go to, right? And here's my hypothesis, right? I think AppSec is uniquely positioned to drive this. Cybersecurity, I mean AppSec too, because we are the only ones of the entire group that can speak with everybody. Right? If you work with a good team in a good environment, you should be probably one of the few entities in that entire organization that can actually have productive relationships with every single member of the organization across horizontal and vertical. Right? The cybersecurity team has access to everybody from the CEO all the way down to every level of the company and is the only one that can literally speak ac across every single product team or, or business division without being involved in politics. Right? And we can get data from them. So it's an insanely position to be to drive business value. Right? So I think we, we have the hypothesis. Right? So, Let's, take, let's talk a little bit about Gen AI, right? And by the way, I've, I've been doing some thinking. You can read about this. These presentations I've done, right? It actually is quite interesting because I, 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 it goes all the way from my graph, graph days and then worldly maps. And if you don't know what, what that is, you really need to, right? And then I kind of will evolve and eventually I go into these kind of Gen AI things, you know, this kind of world of becoming more productive, right? And all this is online, right? And uh, by the way, this is actually a really cool presentation I did when I applied for a job, right, a while back. Um, so it's a big deal, and you focus it. I'm going to fly through this because actually this is I think the, the previous part was fast. Okay, so it's, you know basically you know Jenny is not a silver bullet. Anybody wants to buy a silver bullet? You know I have a bridge to sell you, right? Uh, uh, there's a, actually the, we're interesting phase now. There's a lot of people who are saying no about this, and I think it was Mark Curfew, the first guy I heard saying this, right? It's, it's like it's very difficult for actually a person right to, to understand something when the salary depends on their understanding. So a lot of people will look at this and going, oh, it sucks because he's doing spelling mistakes, right? But, and, that, and, that, and it's interesting because I see a lot of very clever individuals and very clever companies completely missing the point, right, of, of what JI can actually, Gen AI can actually do for them, right? So there's only two technologies in the last two years that really impressed me, right? The first was worldly maps. Again, to so say again, if you don't know what this is, you're missing the biggest thing like, until Gen AI came. And now I think that's, it's a little bit better than, you know, worldly maps. But worldly maps, in fact, I did a post recently that says, it really gave me a lot of zen worldly maps, because for the first time, I understood how things happen. I understood why they happen. I understood why I was not mis I was underst underst you know, understood. But also, I, I really understood how to create really good environments, right? And, and you know, again, if, you, if this is the first time you've seen this, you're missing a massive thing. So there's a lot of presentations. See Simon Worley's presentation, right? It's incredible, right? Again, here's a map of security. In fact, uh, uh, this, here's the thing, right? So this is kind of how maps goes, right? You know, before security LLMs were there, right? No, actually, sorry. Before, this dot was here, right? And this is the evolution, genesis, custom build, product, and commodity, right? What happened when ChatGPT came along? It took a dot from there and put it here, right? And then what's happening is this is all moving there, right, very fast. And if you are in this space, you know, you, you really need to rethink, right? Because that now is a massive change, right? And this is a great way to understand how everything fits, everything works. Again, I think like this, right, in maps. And uh, again, if you want to think, by the way, the Open Security Summit again, has a lot of good stuff on it, some great presentations. And this is one of the things that, again, if you understand this concept, which is innovate, leverage, and commoditize, you understand a lot about how the great companies evolve, especially how Amazon does. And fundamentally what it is, is you basically commoditize something, then you let your ecosystem innovate, then you harvest it, and then you basically you commoditize that bit, and then you, you rinse and repeat. And this is exactly what Amazon has been doing, like, to a T, right? And it works crazy, you know, eff you know effectively. So, right, so everybody will be impacted, but, you know, a lot of people are excited, a lot of ignoring, some panicking, right? One of the reasons why I think Gen AI is a little bit different than in the past 
was because some of the companies that panicked two years ago were these companies. Right? Where in the past, a lot of the biggest companies in the world ignored. They ignored the internet, they ignored the mobile phone, they ignored the cloud, but this didn't. Right? They realize you know, the opportunity and the threat to their business. So they invest in crazy, right? And I actually asked ChatGPT to help me with this one. But the, here's the thing, right? You can argue that you know, the iPhone, when they came along, this comes with a way better position, right? Again, the cloud, mobile, right? You know, others, right? Oh, a lot of these companies, they saw a change, they're going, yeah, it's all right. You know, we don't have to worry about it, and you know what happened to them, right? And by the way, it's not about the Terminator, right? This might be an issue, but not, it's not for us to deal with this, right? And also, yes, stupid people will do stupid things, right? So, it, you know, so that's okay, right? That's always going to happen, you know, that's the thing, right? And this is the image, right? Yes, you know, you know, Sam, you know Sam's you know, little message was interesting. That, that got my curiosity. This was the image where I was like, this is not a code prediction freaking thing, right? When I saw this image, and let me explain what it is, right? This is actually from Adobe Firefly, right? That in the middle is the original image, right? That is the expansion. In fact, it's one of the thousands, the millions of variations that, in this case, Firefly or ChatGPT or DALI can create. Not DALI, but you know, this, that particular generative AI can do. That for me was the moment like, whoa, the level of, of in basic understanding, the level of context that something will, somebody would need to create that is off the charts, right? And then here's other variations, right? Like the Mona Lisa, Nirvana, you know, Adele, Metallica. And you could see, like, you know, you go, hey, can you add a shark to it? Can you take a shark out? Can you make a Metallica f a Master of Puppets fun with cake, without cake, whatever, right? But you have to understand that. The cost of changing something here is enormous, right? The cost of changing something here is 0 0.1 cents, right? That changes the whole law. And this was the moment I started to think in terms of text. Now, the crazy thing from a security point of view, and you know, if anybody knows different, I would love to have a conversation, is that we, don't, we still don't know how this, is, that's how this happens, right? And that's very important, right? We still don't know exactly how it happens. So my crew understanding is that there's a whole bunch of layers. The bottom layers are like syntax, so let's say in text, right? Syntax, you know, you know uh, text, grammar, all that jazz. And by the time you get to the thousand, the ten of thousand layers, you have, con you know, um, I, I don't say, you know, structure, humor, you know, all sorts of meta languages, right? There's a really cool theory that says that ChatGPT discovered actually how we think in a way, how we generate content in our heads, but there's no pr theory to prove that today. Now, think about that when I, when I mentioned putting ChatGPT in line or LLM in line, that we don't understand how the hell this thing happens, right? So, so the idea that there's not going to be some crazy, ridiculous vulnerabilities is, is basically is, is not thinking that, you know, I was trying to find a screenshot from 30 years ago where somebody, I think it was from Microsoft, that had a screenshot of a function in Windows that was called save copy, which was literally a string copy. And the, all he had was an exception, right? At the time, that was our understanding of safe, right? Oh, we, we, trial, we try and catch, right? And, uh, and that's the, the craziest definition of a buffer overflow, right? So, you know, we still don't understand it. So here's the thing, right? If you do this, input, intermediate representation, and output, because that's kind of what happens, right? You have Gen AI takes this, creates an intermediate representation, and gives you the output, right? Um, what I think is very dangerous, especially from a security point of view, is to do this, right? And I just want to say very clear, if, if you or anybody that you guys involved are putting an LLM in line with potential malicious traffic, you're in for a crazy surprise in the next six to 12 months. And if you want to get into pen testing and hacking, this is, this is like a field day, right? This is, again, this is 2001 all over again on Web Apps World, right? I think we're going to see some ridiculous exploits on Gen AI, on the models, on the poisoning, getting data out of it, et cetera. In fact, I would argue that you have to assume that every piece of data that exists on an LLM is publicly available to whoever talks to it. Like literally, I would start there, right? If you have any other assumption, you are at a massive risk, which is why I don't think the game is on customizing models. It's about prompts, because there you can control what gets fed in. It's about read-only models, for example, right? Which I think is super key. So the other part here is, it's, this is how you want to think about this, is the input, intimate representation, proposed solution, human gen AI verification. And I think that's key, 
right? I think it's key that you have a human in a loop. This is about human augmentation, right? It's not about human replacement, right? That's how we should be thinking about it, is this human ownership. And the thing I have here, pull request, which is I was going to zoom in. And by the way, my slides get worse the more I go in, right? Because I was running out of time. So, um, but the, um, I think there's one mis massive concept here is that everything that we do with an LLM needs to have a git diff, needs to be stored, needs to have a history record of everything that happens, right? Again, that's again how we're going to scale, right? So basically, uh, so it's basically the model is don't do that at the top. Input gen AI user output. Again, if you want to hack and found stuff, focus here, right? Because you know, that field is, is crazy, but actually have something like that, right? Have that human ownership, has that, have that feedback loop built into the system, right? Which is very powerful, right? So again, right, you know, human human answers, you know, so feedback loops, I'm just gonna skip to this. This is a great presentation, by the way, you know, Trevor Noah talks about the bias, the fact that at least with Gen AI, we can deal with the bias, right? And, um, and the other thing is, by the way, I'm a massive fan of trigger incidents, right? I think running P3s as P1s is great to get stuff done, but also we should then have incidents every time the Gen AI misbehaves in a way that we're not supposed to, then we fix it and then it goes back to thin. Now, let's quickly talk about Gen AI security, right? I think I mentioned this, right? To say it again, don't put LLMs and, or Gen AI in line, right? I think that's crazy dangerous, right, on this, right? And your LLMs should be read-only. They should not be able to modify them because there's some already crazy hacks where people that, for example, poison a model and then they can't unpoison it. Right? And then, you know, think about how do you do data erasures, right, in a, in a model? See, if we don't even understand how the hell that data is actually put in the first place, right? So my view here is that we want models that are basically locked. And this is where I think AWS had a really cool thing with the concept of foundation models, right? Because it's about having lots of different models and you find the best model. In fact, the best model is code. Right? That's the interesting thing. Right? The best model is actually what is the middle amount of code which is actually deterministic to do the same thing. And I actually think there's going to be an interesting research on using the LLMs to find the exact code. So you, you, you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller in a way AI models, they become more and more and more predictable right, as we go along. Right? So the other one is, and this is the crazy thing, right? this is where I think we're going to see some insane exploits. Is, you know, so you already have a, an LLM that we don't know how it works. right? And we're going to assume that people will be able to control, or attackers will be able to control that. So what you're going to do is going to connect that to an API that's going to be connections to other systems, right? That is going to fly really well, right? This is the same thing as when people were connecting uh, APIs to web services, and you exploit the web service and something. I think, I, know, I think once we, we got told to stop a, a pen test because somebody told us that we were hacking at the company. Right? I was like, how did that happen? <laughs> it's like, yeah, because you know the system that you just got hit was connected. This system and now had a direct line to this other company who's like, oh, hold on. Why is this guy attacking us, right? So this is going to, again, spectacular. Again, you know, again, if you're on the defense side, don't do this. If you're on the attack side, go after this, right? Um, and again, you know, if you're in hacking and pen testing, like have a field day, right? This is going to be massive, right? Um, which is why you want read-only models. You want models that have no content, and you want models that basically are highly predictable, right? And that's why when I start my research, and you, you can actually see a post of me going to Portugal with like 30 books, right? I actually drove so my wife couldn't complain on the side of the books. And I literally took 30 books because when I go into this, I bought a book of every area. And I thought that my research was going to be about the model. So I start reading, I start geeking on it. And I was like, fuck, this is complex, right? And, um, and I got into it. Um, I still remember thinking that it's, Ill comp it's, it's complex, but it's not as complex as the maths I was doing in university. So still think that was a bit over the top. But, um, but the more I got into it, I, re I thought it was like the prompt here and the model there, right? And the more I got into it, I realized, actually, no. The models are a commodity. The models actually want to be predictable, right? What we want is prompts. And then as the prompt size grew, I was like, yeah, that's the name of the game, right? And, and at the time, it was like 2,000 characters. Now it's like, you know, 200,000. I think Google just said a million, right? Like now, once the context windows get to a certain size, that's the name of the game. Then it's a cost issue, not uh, a model issue, right? So. This is the bit where I think is going to be a massive change, right? And, and I need to do a presentation just on this, right? So I want to imagine this world, right? In the past, every change that somebody wanted to do in security, in the business, was code, right? Every new feature, every bug was code that you need to change, right? We want to get to a world where a lot of that logic is in prompts. 
right? So when you have, when the business wants a new feature, when you want a behavior change, you modify a prompt. And the prompts can be happening in real time. You can have all sorts of things to validate the prompts. You can have models on top of models. But the speed of development is going to be crazy. And this is what I think is a game changer. And this is where I think in AppSec, we want to get to the model where, to the mode where a lot of the stuff that we do is around, is around this business logic layer, which in the past was missing. Right? In the past, if I wanted to integrate a SAS result with a, with a DAS result, with the source code, how the fuck are you going to do that? Right? And that's why there's all industries that had to solve that, and they haven't. But now I can take that result, even a, a, the most untrackable XML freaking report that is produced right? from these two different tools. I can give it the source code and go, hey, ChatGPT, can you connect the dots? And you will. Right? It doesn't mean it's not perfect yet, but imagine when you even clean up the code a bit more. Right? So, and that's the other thing here. right? If you're building a Gen AI tool or adding Gen AI to a product, right? first of all, you need to understand worldly maps. If you haven't done a worldly map, you actually have to do a worldly map. Have I mentioned you have to do a worldly map? Right? Because you don't bet against OpenAI, AWS, Google, Microsoft. Right? You know, if, you're, if you're doing anything that is on their roadmap, you, all you have is a little advantage. Right? And for example, when Sam mentioned, like, yes, in my generation, you could develop a SAST engine and milk it right, for 10 years. Not that we did it, but a lot of companies did it. Right? And, and we had a crazy amount of industry that was ridiculously inefficient because none of them freaking open sourced the thing. Right? So now that's not possible. Right? You, your, your little advantage is literally going to be destroyed by this next generation of, of these tools. So again, you, what you want to do is you want to con commoditize this crowd. Right? You want to leverage them, right? not bet against them. If you do, well, you know, it's going to happen. So I was trying to find a better word for this. So I was trying to find what I was almost called the black and white upset, because that's what my kids say anything before they remember is the black and white days. You know? My kids were like, so, so which apps you had at school? Right? Just to see how off they are, right? Like the idea of a, a non-internet, a non-mobile world, right? So that's the black and white days. I kind of call it the analog app sec, right? So, um, and by the way, in that world, uh, I, I created this thing called the O2 platform, which, you know, um, Sam actually mentioned. And I say, I actually, I think I saw and code the future, but it was crazy. By the way, this is a crazy research project. On the other hand, open source everything you do because you still have it available 15 years later, right? It's really cool, right? And, um, and you can read about it. And to be honest, there's still insane technology here. If you guys want to pick it up, there's stuff in here that even today the tools are not doing, right? And I, I can't believe I'm going to play a video from 2011, right? And this was me going to the industry going, come on, please innovate. Here's the freaking ideas, right? I'm going to do something else now because I want to become a CISO, right? But hey, you know, take this on, right? So this, right? It's a real-time vulnerability creation feedback inside Visual Studio, right? Here is a developer coding, happy and nicely, right? A web page. It comes in. You can see there's real-time compilation and there's real-time security analysis, right? Sta 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 um, SAS analysis. This is, by the way, this is using cat.net, which is a great project that actually Mark Curfee picked up and then got killed in the mix of a bunch of other things. But OK, so you got here, you got the app, you got hello request. You can see taint on name. It goes in here. And as soon as you can see, it's fine because it's a static stream, as soon as you connect the dots, immediately feedback, right? Immediately feedback on the UI. Cool. Hey, you have a vulnerability, right? So if I come in here and I put a static string, hey, I fixed it. Now, these days I would add these two tests, but you can see the cool, right? So when I put a safe string, I put HTML in code, name, there you go, right? In fact, it's still there because I haven't connected the thing, right? So it's a good example. I see still vulnerable because I hadn't connected the name of the variable, right? So now let's look at some SQL injection, right? So, but the cool thing about this is this is a real time feedback loop in the browser, right? These days, you, you freaking figure an LLM on top of this. You have context, all sorts of lovely things, right? But again, this is not that hard to do, right? Um, so yes, this is what you can do with, a, with a, um, uh, what's it called, the O2 platform at the time. Um, so yeah, pretty cool thing, right? So yeah, you can see then, then it goes into this, and then it goes into file ejection. So yeah, it's not there. It's actually a OS project. My fault. I didn't maintain it. So if anybody wants to help, off you go, right? It's open source, right? It leaves a bit of love, right? It used to be there. It's not there anymore, right? It's actually my fault, right? I just didn't have the time, right? Because actually, to be honest, this was written in .NET, and I kind of moved away from .NET, so that doesn't help. Uh, I did another cool project, which you should check out. This actually is maintained, and actually was open source, I think, with Sam, because I did a cool bot, and Sam was like, dude, open source. Like, actually, that's a good idea. So I open sourced it, and it's cool because I open sourced it because I was able to keep it from three companies already, and I keep evolving it, so it's really cool, right? And by now, I arrived with all this technology, so nobody's going to complain. So it's really cool. You can actually see my history here. You see Kubernetes. You can see Graph, Elastic, Jupyter, Datadog, G Suite, LLMs, AWS, Utils. These are all Python APIs, by the way. And these all APIs make it super easy 
right, to script. So I'll give you an example. I can code in AWS lambdas in real time. I can be coding, I, can, I make a code change, I run a test, I deploy, publish, test, execute a Lambda function in about three seconds, right? The productivity gain that you have with that is insane, right? So this is kind of it, right? You think bought a free school, should check this API, right? Again, it's a lot of love. If you want open source projects to maintain, hey, you know, off you go, right? You get jobs out of this, by the way, you know, because that's a great place to hire. So, by the way, I think our industry is part of the problem, right? It's like, if as a CISO, this is what it looks like, bloody hell. Right? So fucking broken, right? And, and look at OWASP, right? It's like, yay, cool, yeah, where do I start? Right? So, you know, we really need, again, LLMs are great to start to understand this, right? Give me context, talk about this, right? That's the thing. So, one interesting question is in AppSec is who's paying for it, right? And if the security team is paying for it, you know something is wrong already. Because everything we do should add value to tech, IT development, and it ideally should be the business who's paying for it. So we already know our industry is broken because most of us get paid by security, right? And it shouldn't be. It should be the business because we should be adding business value. Again, we should be telling the business how the thing works, right? And that's, again, we are at that epicenter, right, of everything, right? So what I like about this is about safety and trust. So the first thing I also say as a CISO, when I, first time I meet the board and the execs, I always say, because they will like to, hey, are we safe now, right? Are we secure? I said, no, no, dude. My job is not to ha not have incidents. My job is to prevent the crisis. In fact, I'm going to generate lots of incidents, right? Because I really like to run P3s or P1s. But I think it's very important that it's about the resilience of the system, right? It's not about security. You know, it doesn't matter if you have a crazy vulnerability here, right? Because if you have a crazy vulnerability here and there's no assets there, who the fuck cares? Right? What matters is there's this middle level vulnerability here, which is connected to that, which connects to the internet, which is connected to an attacker that might actually exploit you, not that science fiction attacker that you think is really cool, but it's never actually exploited you and is not going after your company. So, okay, yes, it's exploitable, but who the, who's has done it? Right? We're here, that's a problem. Right? So, I think we're a great industry. I think we actually know how to write. There's a lot of, you know, uh, I, I know, actually, I know the Daniel, what's, uh, Daniel sorry, what's the theme of your presentation, but I, I think we actually know how to deploy, maintain, and run uh, secure apps, right? I think we, we have, 20 years ago, I don't think we knew how to do that, right? I think now, given enough money, resources, we can protect apps, right? And you can see that. There's apps in the world that survive the most sophisticated advanced attacks in the planet, right? And they don't get compromised left, right, and center, right? So we know how to do this. Our problem is scale. Right? Because in a way, I think a lot of this is, what is the app in AppSec? Is it the code, the web server, the container, the Kubernetes host, the sim, the cloud, etc.? Here's the cool thing, right? It's actually all of them, right? And so we need to think about the app has everything. And the coolest thing on AppSec is actually, we actually have a lot of things to teach to a lot of this crowd, right? Because if you talk to the container crowd, the Kubernetes, the, the, you know, the stuff, they don't even do testing. Right? They go, oh, I don't need testing. My, my CloudFormation is declarative. It's like, so is the code, right? But we still test the freaking thing, right? So, so if you look at the maturity of AppSec as an industry, we actually are really good. We need SaaS, we need DAS, we need all of those technologies for everything. So you need, you need to start thinking as the app has the whole lot, right, uh, of this. So finally, right, you know, I think if you're an experienced AppSec professional, it's a great time to be involved. If you're a novice or student, it's a great time to be involved. Right? If you have imposter syndrome, it's a great time to be involved. Right? And whatever you are, it's a great time to be involved. In fact, it, the, one of the things I always try to do is that I try to bring talent outside of security to security. Right? I had some great successes. Right? And I'm a big fan of hiring you know, doctors and nurses and, and bartenders right? and anybody who's passionate about and they're really good in their professional because they have an ability to learn and, ability and desire for it. And actually, a lot of times we talk about imposter syndrome. There's a lot of amazing talent that has trespasser syndrome. So they don't think they should even be there. I think in a weird way, with a new reset of Gen AI, it's, it's a bit like being back in AppSec 20 years ago, right? Sometimes you look at some industries and go, oh, you know, yeah, I missed the boat, right? You know, it was there. I, I could have done it if I was there at the time. Well, guess what? In AppSec, with Gen AI, we're back where we started, right? So it's really cool, right? So again, we can do a lot of stuff. And now I'm not going to go to this because I ran out of time, but also my slides. I'm not very good by now, but I'm just going to you know, give a quick thing. I think on thread modeling is going to be insane because finally we can actually freaking create architecture diagrams of the code programmatically. We can actually map. And again, a thread modeling tool done to a great degree will basically be used by the business everywhere. Because if you go to any team and go, hey, do you want to know how your code actually works? They go, yeah, let me know when you find it, right? Do you like an architecture diagram that's up to date and changed, right? We'd like to see a delta of the things, right? 
And by the way, threat modeling is just a social engineer way of getting the business to give you a, an architecture diagram, how it works, right? And to think about vulnerabilities, right? That's fundamentally what it is, right? But I think it's going to be insane here. I think learning and mentoring is going to be massive, right? The bots, I think the, the biggest, you know, again, one of the biggest changes that the LLMs will bring is learning. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask ChatGPT to teach you something. It's incredible, right? I, I can learn so much more efficient now because I can question. And I think we're going to be able to create amazing learning paths for people that had no idea about a topic and, um, and to another topic here. Um, actually, Maeve's not here, is she? Yeah. But I, I, I actually had a great example, right, of how this works. With, Maeve, by the way, is, is a great, I think, a great success. She came in, joined uh, one of the teams I had as a, a work experience. Actually, she took holidays, right? She did two weeks with her as work experience. We love her so much. We hired her as a junior. Now I think she's a, got hired as an AppSec DevOps specialist, right? Amazing. But I had a session with her where she was once doing a thread modeling. And she was pretty young, right? Like you could see that she's the kind of person that any hardened developer would just destroy, right? You know that, you know, sometimes they go, oh, I have no time for you. You don't even know what a code commit is. I'm going to like destroy you, right? But she, I ha, she, you, know, you know the reporter when they have like the earpiece, right? Actually, I think it was on Slack, but I was listening to it. So I start feeding her questions, right, about the system. And you should see how the temperature changed in the room, right? And she was just acting like one of those reporters, like, so what about the architecture of this, this, this? And what about this? And what about that? It was great. But also show me that if you take somebody that is really clever and specialist, right, so, and give it, the, for example, something like ChatGPT, they can learn so much more. Because maybe they don't know what SSH was, but now they can learn. And they can say, explain to me what SSH or SQL injection is for a doctor. And they can do it. So I think learning is going to be massive. And I think our kids need to really learn how to use this thing. Again, security champs in learning. You know, again, this thing, finally, they can talk to each other. They can have context. They can make sense of all this. I think secure coding is going to be finally massive because we can have context. We can understand what we're doing. You know, and the other thing that's really cool about this is we're finally going to be able to know which builds to block and which builds not to block. Because if you actually if you work in an environment where it's shipping every day, you can't review everything, right? But finally, we're going to be able to have context on the stuff that's happening. Infrastructure cloud, we're going to finally understand what the hell is running in our cloud environment. And then the WAPs, again, going to Ivan's thing. I think we can be, finally be able to connect and intersect and re have real-time uh, connections to this. And then one of the things that, again, soft develop my cycle to scale. Pen testing is going to be really cool. And by the way, you know, we, we, are, we are a bit on a time frame here, right? Because the attackers are improving, right? They're not there yet. Right? And then again, if you've, done, if you've done this for any long time, there's a moment where you, ha you have this existential question, which is, why haven't others found this before? Right? Or am I, why am I the first one here? Right? And sometimes it's literally that th there was no attacker with a business model to be there. Right? But that's going to change because the scale and the ability, and again, they're going to be using the same techniques. Right? But, but again, we need to be better at this, and observability, and this response. And this is one of the things, and there's a great OS project, I think, called Proactive Security, right? This is one of those things where, I, I, again, we saw the future, and it was like, yeah, but we can't get there, right? But the idea here is that our apps should react to the environment, right? There's, our apps should understand if they're under attack, under resource, they should respond to what's happening, right? In a much more profound way. And again, with, with LLMs, we can have that context to really make that possible. So again, an area that is super exciting, right? And then, actually, I'm not going to go through this, but one more thing. By the way, this is my research project. i am be doing the cyber boardroom. You can personalize it. There's, you can talk to a bot, blah, blah, blah. You can say, ask, I can personalize it. So actually, I ask it to be funny. So if I go, what's door? It tells me, well, not the explorer but this and then and the thing about this you want to understand is that if you play with it Tina this is all that is needed to create a bot that is actually quite effective right all you have to do is give a prompt that you're helpful blah 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 you this you this you that and you have a, a crazy prompt and here's a really funny thing right I and I actually think right that sometimes we take ourselves very seriously right so I went to Atina and I changed it. I said, hey, by the way, so I actually changed the system prompt, right? I said, you know, maybe you call it Camões, that's a Portuguese guy, right? That we all study, but nobody understood. It's a bit like Shakespeare, right? And, um, but I said, can you be highly sarcastic and jaded about cybersecurity, right? So then when I said, hey, you know, should I care about cybersecurity? You know, I love this line, right? Hey, welcome back to a thrilling episode of let's try not to get hacked today. Right? And then supported by you, you know, hey, why should you care about cybersecurity? So I think this is really cool, right? I, I like the fact that finally, right, we can create customized messages for every single stakeholder that we have, right? I remember once asking my team to create 10 versions of report and they freaked out. 
and, and we already have graphs on this, right? And we have Jira automation. But in my head, I was like, shit, I want 200 versions of this report because I need one per person, per target, per environment. So if you think about execs and board members or even team members, you need to create a version for them of what you have, which is customized to them, their personality, their language, their context, what they know, what they care about, how they think about, etc. Now we can. Right? And that's the crazy power. And you can even make it funny or not funny. Right? You can say, that person has no sense of humor. Just give me bullet points. Right? Give me one paragraph. Give me one word. Whatever. Right? It's really cool. So, uh, and again, read that. There's tons of stuff in there. And uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> A little bit of the time. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, before you go, because obviously we will have uh, time for questions after Daniel's talk, and uh, stick around because we are also going to have a quiz. There are some awesome prizes to win if you know uh, answers to questions about OWASP. There was one question submitted, and that okay. was ChatGPT or Bart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think at the moment, look, well, I have more experience with ChatGPT. I, I see. I think ChatGPT until that little hiccup that happened, you know. <laughs> last year, right? I think ChatGPT is giving a master class on how to execute. Like literally, it's a master class. The way they're bringing features, the way they're introducing things, the pace they're doing, the way they're scaling, the priorities. You, you think it's easy, I work in, corp in big companies, to be able to pull that off with that execution. And, and the only other company I saw doing that was AWS, right? They, they're giving a massive master class. And, and, and that, so for me, I think, you know, the UI that I like, that I use every day is ChatGPT. I think Google is catching up, right? And I think with Gemini, there's a lot of great stuff, right? You know, again, I, I guess I should show you where I am. And, and again, don't, <laughs> don't, don't bet against Google, right? <laughs> In fact, I, I think, I, to be honest, I think ChatGPT did, did a great favor to Google, right? Because every time Google came up with a, a new Gen AI stuff, their stock price would go down, right? Because there will be somebody making a mistake. So in a way, ChatGPT allowed Google, right, to really jump a couple of generations, right? Because suddenly they could bring their own stuff. Where before, you remember that every time Google would talk about, you know, gen, you know AI, you know, the stock price would go down because somebody found a hallucination, right? So, but yeah, now again, don't, don't bet against Google, right? Like Google is like, you know, like the, the AI stuff they have, it's, it's pretty incredible, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, but I think at the moment, I think ChatGPT in the, in the environment, in the functionality, in the multi-model, you know, I think has a little bit of an edge on it. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis.